Welcome tonight to this collaboration between New South Wales Public Libraries for a series of online author events. It's wonderful to know that there are library members tonight joining us from across the state. Sit back and relax. And if you have a question for our author this evening, do feel free to add it to the Q&A box and we will get to questions from the audience towards the end. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which each of us are this evening. I am on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay respect to Aboriginal elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to other First Nations people. My name is Jen Martin and I work for City of Sydney Libraries. And it is my pleasure to introduce one of Australia's finest journalists and now one of our finest crime writers, Chris Hammer. Chris was a journalist for more than 30 years, covering both Australian federal politics and international affairs. You may remember him as the roving foreign correspondent for SBS's flagship current affairs program, Dateline. And Chris's first book, The River, was a really important cultural, social and environmental history, telling the stories of those that called the Murray-Darling Basin home. But 10 years on, Chris's first novel, Scrublands, was released to critical acclaim. And Scrublands is an epic and deep novel about rural life in Australia, in the same tradition as Australian greats like Peter Temple and Gary Disher. And Scrublands introduces to us journalist Martin Scarsdale. And since Scrublands, Martin has offered us the eyes through which to examine Australian life in two more books, Silver and now Trust. From the country to the coast and now to the big smoke, we really welcome this fresh perspective and compelling new voice in Australian crime fiction. And we're very pleased to have you here with us tonight. Welcome, Chris. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Chris, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. And in some, say, in some ways, it's sad that we're not able to have our conversation in person this evening. But I also take heart that people are streaming in tonight from over 20 different libraries around the state, and that many of them are cosy at home, like I am tonight. And look, it's been a strange year for all of us. But you were working hard in the early months of 2020 to deliver your third novel. And I have to say, it's been really surreal reading about Sydney, the city I call home, while I've spent very little time out and about in the city this year. But it was really comforting to feel such a strong sense of place and walk down so many familiar streets with your characters and trust. So maybe set the scene for us. What's happening in Sydney as this book begins? Okay, this, this is a book about I guess, corruption and conspiracy and crime and collusion, high level power and organized crime and money laundering and things like that. So where better a place to set a book like that than in Sydney, right? Um, so there's a, it's a bit of a difference with this book because Scrublands is set in a real landscape out on the Hay Plain, Western New South Wales, Western Riverina. But the town in Scrublands, River Sand, is a fictional town. And the same in Silver, set on the north coast of New South Wales, as sort of a real landscape, but once again, a made up town. Here, uh, it's Sydney. I mean, what's the point of trying to make up a, a city? So, and many of the locations in the book are real locations that people recognise. Of course, there's individual buildings and individual houses that are made up. Um, but in a, in a sense, even though it's a real place, it's still an, an imagined landscape. So it's a pretty gritty Sydney. It's not, it's not postcard Sydney. It's not the harbour and the opera house and Bondi beach. It's more the inner city and it's set in a kind of post COVID world where the disease has kind of gone, but the, the residue is still there, the economic impact. So it's a rather, it's a rather hard, sort of gritty sort of place. And that, and that suits the mood of the story. Absolutely. From, from torrential rain to bushfire smoke, 
Um, I feel like you really made Sydney feel quite gritty. I love the tour of so many great neighbourhoods. I love the glimpses into people's homes. But also just the fact that this was my first post-pandemic read. This was the first time that I'd read about the city that in some ways I feel like we've been inhabiting this year and a glimpse into what the next year might look like for us. So I feel like you really tapped into that pandemic structure of feeling. I've got a great quote from the book that um, really gives us that sense. The world flows through the dusk, dressed in greys and monochrome, heads down and unsmiling, as if the people of Sydney have been subjugated by the weather, have adopted the grimness like a fashion, a throwback to the days of the pandemic. But of course, before the pandemic, we also had the bushfires that we experienced over the summer. Was this the mood that you were trying to set for this book? It was. So I'd written a book. I pretty much finished the, the manuscript and sent it to the publishers. I was finishing it off in about February. So as I was finishing the book, um, COVID was just this kind of rather exotic news story about a, an unknown disease in China. And then, of course, as everyone remembers, it really hit quite quickly. We went from that to being in lockdown and that of course affected the book what was i going to do about that the first thought was just to ignore it but the trouble is there are already references in the book to uh the bushfires um and there's burning off and there's smoke in the city and, so, and i thought how can i be referencing one kind of disaster and then completely ignoring another and that's but on the other hand, I had no idea what the situation would be like in six months' time, like now, when the book came out. Would we all still be in lockdown? Would it have passed? Would we have a, a vaccine? So I thought, I can't set it. Then I've got to set it slightly, you know, post-COVID when it's over, but the effects are still being felt. And in a, so I don't labour on it because I try and keep it fairly vague. But... In a sense, it helps because for those people who have read uh, Silver, in that book, Martin and Mandy end up living in this rather ideal situation on his house overlooking, on the cliffs overlooking the ocean on the north coast. So it actually helps the plot and the feel of trust because they've basically sat out COVID in this ideal isolation. And now they're getting pulled out of that and pulled into the city where neither of them really wants to be. Both of them have lived before and have had mixed experiences to living in Sydney, to put it mildly. So in the end, it, it, I think it probably works okay for the book. Um, but it was a bit, it was a bit tricky there. And, um, and, you know, I know a lot of other writers are wrestling with the same thing. How do I deal with write a book where I don't know how it's going to finish. It's a similar feeling in some ways, I guess, to what we're all feeling. We've all had our cosy little bubbles, you know, we've all had our lives going on, hopefully well, and then suddenly to be pulled out of that. And so this is the backdrop to the situation that former journalist Martin Scarsdale and his partner Mandy find themselves in, where their world is turned upside down by elements of Mandy's past that she thought were well behind her. And I love how you have managed to tie a little bit of the pandemic in with this and the realisations that Mandy has about her past as the story continues. I love that she realises that we don't live in quarantine from the consequences of our actions. These cannot travel unimpeded into new worlds. There was no vaccine against the past. But the past is a theme that keeps coming back in your novels, from the hidden secrets of the enigmatic priest Byron Swift and Scrublands, to the mystery behind who is Tarkin Malloy and what is he really up to in trust? That question of why keeps reverberating. So why is the why important? Why is it people's motivations that you search into and dig deep into? So... When I first thought I'd write a crime book, I thought it's all about plot, right? You need a really good plot. 
Um, but the more I think about it, the more I wrote, I realised there's other things that are at least as important. Character is very important. Um, setting is very important. But also people's own kind of emotional life. This is this is kind of came as a bit of a unexpected surprise to me when I wrote Scrublands. I was just trying to write a good crime book. But by the end, one of the things that I liked about the book, and I think many readers responded to, was Martin's own emotional journey. It's Martin Scarsden, by the way, not Martin Scarsdale. <laughs> um, so the Martin at the end of Scrublands has evolved, he's changed. He's not the same man, man as a start. And I thought that was, a, that was a really good element of the book because it sits alongside the sort of the who done it, why done it, how done it sort of crime story. And so by the time I finished, there's a scene there and Martin is, um, he's standing on the same bridge at, where he first stood when he came, you know, in the first chapter of Scrublands. And he sheds a tear and, it, and the line says, it's the first time he's cried since he was eight years old. So silver is all about what happened to Martin when he was eight years old. So it's exploring why he's become the person he is and he's got to find out what really happened to his family and to him when he was eight. And so again, in silver, I think one of the most satisfying parts of the book is Martin coming to terms with what happened to his mother and father and his family. And I was finishing that off and I thought, hang on a moment. What about Mandy? Um, who, who, you know, we're introduced to in um, Scrublands, plays an important role, plays an even more important role in Silver. And I realised there was a missing 10 years in her life. We know she grew up in the town where uh, Scrublands is set, that she had quite a traumatic uh, childhood. As soon as she could, when she was 16, 18, whatever, she left the town and didn't come back until she was about 28 to look after her ill mother. So what happened in those 10 years? And I thought, well, if she's fleeing sort of an abusive past in a small country town, she's probably not going to go to another small country town. She's probably going to go to a big city. So I thought, Mandy, 10 years missing in Sydney, I decided, rather than, than Melbourne, what happened to her then? And that was the seed of the story. And then what grew out of that was, how can Martin tell that story? So the first two books, um, Scrublands and Silver, they're told very much from Martin's point of view. It's not first person, but it's very close kind of third person narrative. So Martin is in every scene. He's the person who leads the reader through the story. You can read what Martin is thinking, but you only have his impressions of what other people are, are thinking, right? But he's, although he's quite perceptive about news stories or journalism, he's not that emotionally perceptive. Um, so I thought, how can, he can't tell Mandy's story. And then I thought, well, maybe I need to write it from Mandy's point of view. But where it lands up, and this is a difference from, from the first two books, but I think it works. And I think readers who like the first two books will like this. You get two points of view. You get Martin's and Mandy's, and it pretty much alternates chapter by chapter. One chapter with Martin, one chapter with Mandy. Sometimes they're together, sometimes they're off doing different things. And it affects... So you get to see inside her head as she, she thinks she's escaped her past, but she hasn't. But because the chapters bounce between perspectives, the pace picks up. So the chapters are shorter and it's a pacier book. It's, um, it's a little bit more of a thriller too than a, just a straight crime book because there's quite a lot of action going on as different things before one. So from that small seed of what happened to Manny in those 10 years, that's, that's how the book grew from there. 
Yeah, I really like that multiple point of view perspective in books. It always keeps me reading and keeps me turning the pages. And I do in this novel really like the counterweight between Martin and Mandy's investigation even, the way they in tandem pull all the pieces of the story together. But like all good relationships, you know you're a team, but you don't necessarily know everything about your partner. And so I like the way that they start to share information and start to build it. Um, but there's such an unexpected but also familiar history of partners in crime novels from Sherlock and Watson to Dorothy Sayers, Lord Peter Whimsey and Harriet Vane to Stieg Larsson's Mikhail Blomqvist and Lisbeth Salander. So, you know, we have these crime solving partnerships, but as well as digging deep into Mandy's history, what do you think Martin and Mandy bring to the table? What do they each bring to this problem solving? Well, they're, they're different characters. It's, writing Mandy is a bit tricky because, not because I'm a man writing a female character, but because she is kind of fragile. There is, you know, she's running from her past um, in a different different way. Martin had a very, some shocking events when he was a child, he was eight. That's not Mandy, this is stuff that happened when she was an adult and had some real agency, okay? And one of the interesting things that then builds up, as you say, is their relationship. With the books, the title of Scrublands came to me quite early in the process. Um, and, you know, it's a location. With Silver, I really didn't have a, a title so much. Um, and there was a bit of to and fro in between the, the publisher before we settled on Silver. But with Trust, the, the, the title came to me one day, and it's not the location, it's not the setting. It's about, well, it's about trust. And that's, that's a bit of a theme in the book, particularly how much do Martin and Mandy trust each other? Do they trust the police? Do the police trust them? Do the police trust each other? Um, so it's, this, it's a nice kind of theme to have running under the, all the action, all the action that's going on in the book. Uh, I'll tell you what, what I, so I'll just, I'll just set the book up. So it's just come out, so I don't want to do spoilers, but this gives you a kind of an idea what happens. They're living this idyllic life up on the north coast of New South Wales. There is a prologue in the book that flashes back to events that happened five years before, back when Mandy was living in Sydney. But then the book proper starts, Martin's on the beach, gets a phone call, and there in the first chapter, Mandy gets abducted. There's a police officer unconscious on the floor of their home. And then pretty soon after, Martin finds out that the body of a mysterious undercover policeman who disappeared five years ago has been discovered in Sydney. Everyone thought this policeman, Tarquin and Malloy, had fled overseas. Now they found out that he was murdered. And Martin pretty quickly works out that if Mandy's been abducted, she's probably been taken to Sydney. And hence he's forced to follow her. And that's like that's right at the start of the book. So that's not really a spoiler. And then we're we're kind of they're they're kind of playing catch up, both of them, the whole time, because events start moving around them. And so it's not like there's been a crime and they've got the luxury of, of exploring it because the discovery of this body in Sydney sets off a whole chain reaction of different events. So they're kind of playing catch up and both of them are wondering who they can trust. Absolutely. And there's a lot of um, power relationships built on trust or lack of trust in the book as well. And I love the idea that maybe sometimes in a crime novel, you know, you've got your set conventions and often there's been a crime in the past but also sometimes the crime you think is the crime is not the crime and there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting things that you can do with the plot of a crime novel 
And I do love as well that the trauma that both Mandy and Martin have experienced together and apart in the previous novels comes back into this and that they're reflecting and that they still have to build their relationship and keep that trust there as well. How about Martin's past life as a journalist? I feel like that really comes into its own in this book. So, yeah, one of the things that comes up with Martin is he lived when he sort of fled his hometown he lived in sydney um, as a journalist for something like 20 years and used it as a base to travel overseas and, and whatever so he comes back and he reflects on his past as a journalist and the people who cared for him when he was a journalist and there's kind of reflections on his sort of realization that the glory days of the media and the news media are maybe behind him and yet for all of that he can't help himself he re you know, he wants to help mandy he wants to resolve all this but once again he realizes there is the story to beat all stories in this and he's he's looking in a way of publishing that story and getting it out so his motivations are again are again mixed and he's got the sources, he's got the contacts, but also he's got a very personal connection to this story on at multiple levels. That's true. And it's a bit difficult to talk about that, Jen, because it goes, yeah, I don't want to have any, um, it's probably too much of spoilers, but yeah, it, it's, it's very personal for Martin. It's just mm -hmm. not a story. It's, it's what's happened to people he's trusted and, wondering who he can trust. So that's a, yeah, it's a, who he can trust in the news media as well as the police, what, whatever, yeah. Mm. And you've what, obviously... What, so what, one of the things that I, um, I thought, going right back to Scrublands, I thought I'll try my hand at crime fiction and I was, I was thinking about plotting. And one of the things I, I thought straight up was it's hard because people read a lot of crime and it's, it's really disappointing if a reader guesses kind of who done it or how done it or why done it halfway through the book, right? You don't want that to happen. On the other hand, you don't want in the last 10 pages the author to, to introduce all this new information and a new character and all of that. So there's no way you could have guessed it. You feel a bit cheated. And the way I kind of got around that was I had multiple kind of crimes and multiple storylines. So that even if you guessed one, you're probably not going to guess them all. Um, and that's the same in silver. And it's the same here in trust, but I think um, in trust it almost works a bit better because there are, there are multiple crimes, but they kind of connect in the end, they all do connect together in a very kind of logical, satisfying way. Um, still, I reckon if anyone guesses everything that happens in the book, they're doing better than me because <laughs> once again, I didn't guess everything that was going to happen. I did find that a nice cosmopolitan aspect of the book. You know, finance and technology are so important in this novel and in our world. And so much of our 21st century existence happens in the deep, dark corners of online worlds or hidden in code or hidden in the stock exchange. So I loved those threads and I loved that you had a novel about the old guard, but also about the new world. And especially at the moment, we don't know what's happening next. So I thought that was perfect. And, you know, it's a book that there's sort of high level corruption in the book without giving too much away. And, you know, you turn on the news and there's the Premier in front of ICAC. It's almost like, this is definitely a story that's not a, a story that's been transplanted from a country town. This is the sort of story that really could only happen in Sydney or, you know, a big city like Sydney. And you never really know all the pieces of the puzzle, do you? So what better person than a journalist to help? And I do think you provide really great insight into the journalistic profession, which you've obviously drawn from your own experience. So I love those little details, tension between crime and court reporters, reading between lines on the way a story is reported. Did you relive some of your own journalistic days in writing this? 
Oh yeah, it's informed a bit, but it, you know, it's changed so quickly, Jen. That you know, I've both of the silver and this. I had to ring up friends who are, who are still working journalists. I'm saying, what's the deadlines like this year as they move forward again? You know, back in the old days, you could you know there were multiple editions of newspapers going out until after midnight, and now there's one edition, and you, you know you have to file by six o'clock, and you know, so it happens so quickly. You really have to keep up with keep up with what's happening and um of course we don't have as many sub editors as we used to and so yeah i do think it's a really nuanced portrayal um i do really like the similarity as well between a journalist breaking a story and a detective solving a crime and i wonder if maybe there should be more journalists within the genre it it's a really nice thread it's, look, it's an interesting question because there are a lot of former journalists who have become, you know, quite successful crime writers. So Michael Robotham, you know, former senior uh, journalist, but his main protagonists are, are um, psychologists, Joe Lachlan, Cyrus Haven. Jane Harper was an accomplished journalist. Um, uh, overseas, there's people like Michael Connolly. He does have a journalist character, Jack McAvoy. I think Val McDermott. There's a whole bunch of people who are journalists, but when they come to writing, they pick a, you know, a psychologist or a police officer or whatever as a protagonist. A journalist, I think, is a quite a good protagonist because you do have a reason to stick your nose in where it's not wanted. Uh, it can be a little bit tricky because, unlike a police officer, you don't have ready access to forensic information and you can't arrest people and you can't force them to talk to you. Um, but, you know, it, nevertheless, I think it is quite a good protagonist to have, quite, quite a good way of telling a story. So I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that it's not used more often. And, of course, you, through Martian's eyes and also through your own perspective, are able to provide so much evocative detail as well. You're obviously a master of observation, and it's all those little details that I feel like journalists in long-form pieces and in serious, meaty works of non-fiction bring to help tell their story. So when I was writing uh, Trust, you know, I come up to Sydney quite a lot, and I, I lived here a couple of times, but not for many years. And so I, I, I knew the landscape of the city pretty well and wrote it, but I was thinking I'll, I'll, I'll get the first draft done and then I'll come up to Sydney and I'll check out the various locations to look for exactly that sort of detail. And then COVID struck and we were in lockdown and I couldn't get up to Sydney. So there are bits of it I was kind of relying on Google Street View and, <laughs> and to see what, you know, because like I'd never been inside Surrey Hills Police Station, for example. So, so, so it was, fortunately, I'd, be, I'd spent enough time in Sydney. And you know, sometimes I think the imagined place uh, can be more real than the, than the actual place. Absolutely. And the, I mean, obviously, you drew on memories, places like Trumper Park and Centennial Park and the view over the harbour from Elizabeth Bay. There's just a lot of great Sydney content in this book. Yeah, and, and hopefully, though, it's, I mean, good for people who know Sydney, but for people who don't, it's an imagined sort of place. So if you think of the books that you read, say, set in New York, and it might be, you know, Bonfire of the Vanities, or it might be Sex in the City, or Fleischmann's in Trouble, or Breakfast at Tiffany's, or, you know, whatever, they're all, or, you know, The Great Gatsby, they're all imagined it's a real place but they've all got their own kind of take on it so it's actually fun writing about a real place and then like putting a wash over it like a like a landscape artist might put a wash over a over a painting to create the impression that you want off a real place yeah, I think you really contributed to the psychogeography of Sydney. We've all got our own <laughs> in our minds, and so now that lives on in the minds of readers as well. And you mentioned some of these great Australian crime novelists, you know, who are former journalists. Um, how do you feel being part of a tradition of crime alongside the likes of Peter Temple and Gary Disher, and now, of course, Jane Harper? Well, uh, it's, it's fantastic. 
And of course, P Peter Temple was a journalist. In fact, he was, when I studied journalism at Bathurst in the early 80s, he was my writing teacher. Um, and I don't think he'd written any fiction at that stage, hadn't had anything published. So he wasn't actually teaching us fiction. He was teaching us newspaper, magazine, feature writing. And he was a great stylist. And I think that's one of the reasons I got into writing crime fiction because when his Jack Irish books were, were first being published, you know, I bought them and read them because I knew him. And, you know, I'd always admired his, his knowledge about style, journalistic style. And then, of course, his, um, his two great books, his final books, are Broken Shore and Truth. Um, Truth, of course, won the Miles Franklin Award, you know, a literary award and really demonstrated how far you could push the boundaries of so-called, you know, genre commercial fiction. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons I thought, oh, look, there's, I may never match, you know, his accomplishments, of course, but it's, it is a broad canvas to paint on. Um, look, and at the moment, it's fantastic just how many and how much good Australian crime there is. Um, it seems to have exploded. Uh, this, this year at the Australian Book Industry Awards, there's, there's two prizes for fiction. There's one for literary fiction, and then there's one for uh, general fiction, it's called. Well, seven out of the eight long-listed books in general fiction were crime books. So there was, there was not really... There's no fantasy or spec fiction or romance or really there was Silka's uh, journey, which is, I guess, kind of historical fiction. But that was it. I mean, crime is doing really well. And it's nice to be part of a bunch, if you like, part, part of a, a group who are all sort of doing well at the same time. It's, it's very collegiate. You, over time, you meet people at writers' festivals or doing events or you know, helping launch each other's books, that sort of thing. And it's a really, it's a really nice feeling actually to be part of that. And also to see, you know, some of us succeeding overseas too, which, you know, not that long ago, it was actually very difficult for an Australian crime novelist to get published in Australia. I mean, there were people who would set their books in America because they feared, or England, because they feared they couldn't get them published in Australia. And now not only can we get published here, but there's a lot of interest overseas in the books as well. So it's nice to be part of that, yeah. Mm. And it's such a socially conscious genre, isn't it? So we are telling stories about society, sometimes about social unrest or just trying to, to dig deep into the Australian psyche a little bit and understand ourselves better. There, yeah, there's a couple of things there. I think for a crime book to work well, you have to get into the psychology of the characters. You know, you can't finish a book and say, oh, this person murdered this other person because, you know, they were having a bad day and that's what I, how I want the plot to finish. You have to get inside their head. You need to explain the psychology. But at the same time, you can have a kind of commentary as part of the setting on the state of the society. Um, so Michael Connolly, the, the, the American author of the Harry Bosch books, there's this almost in the background, he deals with the inequities in the American social system. So it's often Harry Bosch investigating crimes against the destitute or put, you know, the down and out. And there's this sense of he wants justice for all. So there's some line that he uses if, if, there's, if they don't get justice, no one gets justice. It's a line like that. And he's reflecting on the state of American society at the moment. And so there's an element of that in Australian books, whether it's what's happening to country towns at a time of drought or what's happening, you know, in a big city with political corruption or inequity. So you don't have to read the books for that. You can just read the books for entertainment. And there's plenty in the, you know, the current crop of Australian crime books. You can just read them for the plot and the entertainment and a good beach read. But, you know, maybe there's some other things to reflect on if you want to. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, there's such a strong sense of place 
in all your books, but especially Scrublands, you know, where you present that ethnography of a dying town, the circling of the wagons against drought and economic decline. Um, there's just such a strong and evocative sense of what it's like for um, so many of our country people out there. And I remember um, after you wrote The River about the Murray-Darling Basin, which was also set during a time of drought and you, you know, traveled and interviewed during drought. Um, but there may have been somewhat of a renewal right after you wrote that book, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, now after I've, I've written uh, Scrublands, you know, the drought's broken. Now I've traveled out in the countryside a bit. I, um, I drove down to Melbourne just for, as it was going into lockdown to, um, to get my son back and up to Canberra and I've, and I've driven up north. And the, and the land is just looking fantastic um, out, out west, the places I've been at any, any rate. And it takes me back, when, when I wrote The River, I'd, um, it was about the millennial drought and I travelled right at the height of the millennial drought, which it took me to places like River Sand in, in uh, Scrublands, irrigation towns where the river was bone dry. And lo and behold, within about three months of the book being published, the drought was broken. and um, and I'd actually found a copy of the river a few months later uh, in a Dimmix, in the history section. I think, great, it must be the only book in the history section written in the present tense. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of, I, you know, now I'm going to have to write a book with floods in it or something. <laughs> it sounds like there's some power in writing, definitely. And all I can hope is if you've written us out of drought in 2009 and again in... 2018. Yeah. Um, maybe you can write us out of our, our present recession and <laughs> public health as well. Oh, uh, don't you wish, don't you wish. <laughs> but no, that's a really hopeful, promising um, prospect. And I do think that novels are about hope. And um, I, I do like the hope that you're able to write into Martin and Mandy's lives as well. Um, it's obviously important at the start of that book that it's there and I know that um, our readers will be really excited to see what happens to Martin and Mandy over the course of this book trust. Yeah it's an it's an interesting ending to this book um, but I think once again it's kind of a satisfying ending um, on that emotional level um, with Mandy kind of being forced to come to terms with her past, the past that she's tried to run away from and um, unsuccessfully so. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how people, you know, whether people like the way it finishes up. But hey, I don't want to talk too much about that now. No, there's only one way to find out. <laughs> yes. And so you're, this book was only published yesterday. It's just brand yeah. new. Brand new, it's out in the stores now. You can now read Trust. Um, are you working on something else now or are you preparing for future writers' festivals? What's happening out there in the world? Look, I am thinking, I'm started working on a new book. Um, otherwise, it, I'm fine when I'm writing them, but just before they, they're published, um, I get really anxious and nervous about how they'll go. And it's, it's kind of stupid because the book's been printed, right? There's nothing I can do about it. But there is this kind of maybe a couple of months be between me signing off and, and the book being published. So it's actually a good time to start thinking. And often, just as I'm finishing a book and doing the edits, stories start bubbling up. So I'm thinking, and don't hold me to this, who knows what will happen in, in the months ahead. I'm thinking of sending a book kind of in the same universe, which means, you know, contemporary Australia, but with some of the same characters that are in the books, but maybe not having Martin and Mandy as the main characters. Maybe they're in the book, but maybe they're not point of view characters and some of the other characters from previous books coming back. So a book that you can read as a standalone, absolutely, but people have read the previous books, you know, might, might enjoy seeing the, the characters come back so there's, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I really liked the Tintin books and you'd get these recurring characters pop up from time to time. 
And I like that in Michael Connolly's books too. You know, he has Harry Bosch, but he also has the lawyer Mickey Haller and he has the journalist Jack McAvoy. And, and sometimes they're the main character and other times they're just a minor character, you know, popping up in the book. So that's what I'm kind of thinking at the moment because much as I have grown to love Martin and Mandy, because the books are tied up with this, big emotional stories with them, I think there's a limit to how, how much I can put, put them through. So, so by the end, the end of uh, Trust, we know all about Mandy's past and by the end of Silver, we pretty much know all about Martin's childhood. So there's, I'm sure there's more challenges ahead, but maybe not in the next book. Might be nice to give them a rest for a little mm. while. <laughs> Well, we might move to questions from our audience this evening. We've got questions coming in from all over New South Wales. Um, and some of these you've already answered, but I like that Emma did ask, and you might want to um, draw on this a little bit more. Emma asked if you intentionally left that 10 year gap in Mandy's life back when we first met her in Scrublands with a view to writing trust? And you've already answered this a little bit. No, I, look, I didn't. Uh, in fact, the books themselves aren't really uh, plotted out. You know, you have this division in crime writers. Um, you get the plotters and the pantsers. And the plotters are people who plot everything out, often in great detail. They, they write like 100 pages or something, you know, like a treatment work everything out, all the nuts and bolts, and then they start writing the narrative. And then you get the pantsers, and these are the people who write by the seat of their pants. And they start a book, and they don't really know where it's going to end up. And I'm more at that end of, this, of the spectrum. So when I started writing Scrublands, I was thinking very much about Martin. But I had this idea of there'd be a few a few tropes I might play on. So one was the priest who, you know, right at the start of Scrublands comes out and shoots five of his parishioners. And I thought people may suspect because he's a priest, it's got something to do with child abuse because that was such a big story in the news at the time the Royal Commission was going on. And, and I planted a few seeds like that. So yes, that's what people suspected. With Mandy, I had this idea of, of, you know, this very glamorous looking young woman in this country town. And so people will think, oh, well, the trope there is Martin is going to save her somehow from this town. And of course, in reality, it's kind of like the opposite happens. Um, she ends up rescuing him kind of emotionally, but also literally. Um, and that was where she started. She just started as that idea. And then in the plot of Scrublands, it was that she'd gone and she'd come back, but I really wasn't thinking about trust at all. No, I mean, that the whole idea and the whole story that's in trust with what happened to her in the city really only started to bubble a little bit as I was finishing Silver. And I, and I realised, hey, there is that 10 year gap. A convenient accident, I think, because it works yeah, really it good. well. <laughs> Another question that has um, slightly been answered, but I'll give a shout, shout out to Kyle Perry anyway, because Kyle is writing from Hobart Library. Kyle's um, home library is Hobart, so it's nice to have um, someone from somewhere we can't go right now. We miss Tasmania very much. But Kyle mentions that um, he loves the explanation about your characters and how it informed your point of view story, um, but wanted to know if you had any ideas to write a standalone for your third book and explore different characters. So you think you knew that there was something that needed to be done with Mandy's gap there and you've got plans for the future. Yeah, so you have got stories bubbling up. I'd say hi to Kyle. Kyle, of course, is the author of the bluffs, which set, set in, in Tasmania. Um, I met him earlier this year, I guess, just, just before, before COVID. So that, you know, so he's another new Australian crime author that's doing you know, really well. Um, 
I, I sometimes I have met a couple of authors who, who who've said that they've planned out the next three books, and I think, wow, how how can you do that? I'm flat out knowing what's happening in the book I'm actually writing now. Um, I do like the idea though of having writing standalone a couple of standalone books. So books like mine or someone like Michael Ropotham, there's a protagonist. Or Dervla McTiernan, you know, with her Cormac Riley books, there's a in her books, you know, there's a police officer. And and they're the protagonist. But then you get books that can work really well where there is no outside investigator who takes the reader through. There's just the people who populate the story. And if they work really well, they can be sensational, like Girl on the Train or uh, Gone Girl or or Woman in the Window. The person who's done that really, really well in Australia is Christian White. His two books, Nowhere Child and The Wife and the Widow, they're completely standalone. It's, It's actually hard because... Every time he writes a book, I guess he's got to reinvent the wheel. He can't go back to the same characters. But there's something very attractive about those books. When when they work well, they're fantastic. And they're often often what they do. The the wife and the widow is like this, and a woman in the window is like this. And there's a big twist there, or at least one big twist, maybe maybe more than one, you know. So um, I don't know, Kyle, it's... uh, We'll, we'll have to wait and see. I, I guess it just depends whether I get a good idea or not. And a question that we have from Jean, which is something I've thought about as well because I um, read Scrublands a few years ago um, and then reading Trust, I did think about this a bit and I like the way that you make reference to the past, but not in a way that the reader needs to understand necessarily. Jean asks if you recommend reading your previous books before reading Trust. I'm not sure it matters. I would, there's been a few people who've read the advanced copies of uh, Trust who haven't read the first two and they've said it's, it's worked, it ha- there hasn't been any problem there. So I think you could easily read Trust and if you like it, go back and start again. If you did decide to read the early ones first, definitely, I would start, I would start with Scrublands. I'd either start with Scrublands or Trust. I wouldn't start with Silver because it's the one in the middle. Mm. And also because Silver really does, in that classic tradition of crime novels, introduce you more to your main character and dig deeper. Um, That I think is definitely something that you access over time. Um, Grant, thanks you very much, Chris. Grant loves your books. Um, And Grant says, I lived in Hay for a while and was so blown away by your ability to describe the climate, geography and feel of the place. So Grant would like to know, how do you do that? How do you access that sense of place in your fiction? I think it's hard to really know. I, I think... You know, I spent a long time as a journalist, as you said, um, and you would think if you read the books, my 30 years as a journalist was as a newspaper journalist. I actually spent more time as a television journalist. So you're used to writing sequences with pictures. So I think it's, I visualise it in my head, the scene in the head, and then sort of more or less describe what I see. And often it's not, you don't have to describe everything. You just need to pick out one or two little details that sort of trigger probably in the reader's memories of places like that. And in the same when I'm writing dialogue, it's almost like I imagine hearing people speaking and, you know, you sort of try and get in their, their heads as they speak. Um, sometimes, some writers you read and their descriptive passages are so effective and now I'm, you know, because I'm a writer, I think, how do they do that? And I, I'm still not entirely sure. Anyway, it's, thank you very much for the, for the comments about Hay, because that really is the landscape around there um, that I was thinking of when I was writing Scrublands. 
Mm, it's amazing feeling the heat and feeling the dust. Um, are there any authors that you read for place to yourself? Like you said that you've loved reading, um, but are blown away sometimes by the way writers write about place. Yes. I mean, I, I'm looking forward to reading um, Trent Dalton's new book because like, yeah, like the rest of Australia, I guess I really like Voice Wallace Universe. And it's, so it has a very kind of idiosyncratic sort of take on uh, landscape. I'm also looking forward to Sophie Laguna's new book because I really like The Choke, which is set down um, on the Murray River. So it's not, so it's not a crime book, it's a literary book, although I guess there's crime in it. But it, it, it evokes a certain feel for the countryside too. And, you know, some of the American authors have um, their sense of their own landscape is really good too. So, and Anne Cleves with Shetland, you know, that sort of barren sort of landscape, cold, windy, raining all the time, treeless. Definitely. I often think that place in crime novels is a character of its own, and often as familiar or as enigmatic as, as our main characters that we travel with in the novels. It really helps the mood of a, of a book. In my books, it does a couple of things. It helps, it helps explain the motivations of the characters. So, you know, Scrubland set in a drought, you know, in desperate times, desperate people do desperate things. It sort of reflects their motivation. Silver, it's, it's more about greed and real estate. Trust, it's more about power and corruption. But in a strange way, it feeds back into the feel of how you're writing the book. So I think the writing in Trust is a little bit tighter, a bit tauter, because that's the feel the setting gives me as I'm writing it. it kind of, it's, it's on a circular thing. Um, a bit hard to explain, but I, I agree. I think setting is really, really important. Mm. We have two more questions. Um, this one's a little tongue in cheek, I think, but it's a nice one. Jackie has asked if the baby has been a hindrance as character and trust. Um, Jackie is wondering if Martin and Mandy are caught up in all this crime. Do they need a na nanny babysitter? And I guess all will become clear with that one. Yeah, um, Uncle Vern steps up, <laughs> if you've read Silver. So, yeah, uh, Liam in this book does not feature as much as he does in the previous two books. Um, yeah, he's not, a, he's not a, a hindrance. But I would... I would like to revisit that because Liam started as a, as a bit of a plot point in Scrublands, but then became very important to Martin's emotional growth. You know, his attachment to the boy is something that's really helping him become a better person. So, yeah, I'd like, I would like to revisit that. Yeah, children can be really healing and a way forward. Um, yeah, I, I, a book that just came out that I read recently was Kate Mildenhall's book, uh, The Mother Fault. And it's great. It's like a thriller. It's sort of dystopian. It's near future. And it features, uh, you know, the, the main character's a woman, but she's got a couple of kids in tow as she's off on this mad sort of adventure. So at one moment, it's this, this full-on thriller. But then she's got these narky kids to look after. And it's this really nice balance. So that's a, that's a book I'd recommend too. That's great. That one sounds really good. Um, and Hayley kind of taps in a little bit to that last question as well. Hayley mentions that she loves how you introduce Mandy's character and how Mandy evolves throughout the books. So Mandy's obviously an important part of this trilogy. Um, and Hayley says that Mandy's femininity is tied in with her capable ways. And she loves that you've captured a strong female so preciously, even when Mandy seems vulnerable. So she wants to know if you drew on Mandy's personality traits from someone you know, or was it everyday observation or from your imagination? I think, I think mainly from imagination, 
but inevitably I must have drawn on people I know. Um, you, so you, you want to get in, inside the head of your characters. Um, if you don't, you know, there'll be inconsistencies in them. That was one of the things I found tricky in writing Manny because I didn't want her to be totally consistent because she's, she's haunted by her past. Uh, she had she has a kind of problem trusting people, right? Just as Martin has problems from his past. So I was trying to imagine what it would be like to be a person in that situation. Yeah, that comes across. And I think that's really great that she does have that development and that struggle. Yeah. Now we have a couple of questions here about your past as a journalist. Sue okay. from Canada Bay would like to know um what stopped you from switching over from journalism to fiction writing earlier not in the first place but what why did you take so long chris <laughs> i don't know i um maybe i wouldn't have been able to do it i think i always had this hankering uh to, to try writing fiction um i did try and write a book when i was in my 20s um which taught me <laughs> I wasn't very good at it. So don't think suddenly there's going to be this book pulled out of my bottom drawer that suddenly gets published because I think it truly was awful. Um, probably having the opportunity, having the confidence, but also having the skills. So I'm really in awe of, of writers who write fantastic books when they're, you know, in their twenties and early. So like, you know, Craig Sylvie's just got his book come out, Honeybee. And I, he, I think he must have been in his 20s when he wrote Jasper Jones, right? I'm thinking there's no way I could have written. I mean, I don't think there's any way I could write a book like that now, but certainly not when I was that age. So maybe, maybe it would have been nice if I was doing it earlier, but I'm not too worried about it because I'm just, I'm enjoying it so much now. And I'm having so much fun and finding it so fulfilling. So, I, you know, I've got no complaints there. That's great. And you've obviously got a really great writing practice as well. You're pumping the books out, which we're very pleased about. Um, Cassie just asked a question which you just answered, which is, do you enjoy writing books more than journalism? And you've certainly said that you enjoy it very much. I Look, I strangely... Enough. I love being a journalist and I really, I got to go to the most amazing places. So, you know, I'm looking at the news at the moment. You see these stories about Nagorno-Karabakh, not so much the forgotten war as the war you've never heard of. Well, I went there. I flew up from Yerevan in an old Russian military helicopter that I hired. This was back in the 90s. I mean, whoever's been to a place like that. So part of the reason I wasn't writing fiction is because I was enjoying my job so much. But now I am. I find it totally liberating. I absolutely love it. I don't have to worry about, well, I don't have to worry about facts, but I don't have to worry about defamation or contempt of parliament or protecting sources or anything like that. And the other thing, of course, so often in journalism and reporting, you can't fully resolve everything. You can't explain everything because you don't know. Whereas with fiction, you can really resolve things to your satisfaction, hopefully to the reader's satisfaction. So yeah, I look, I, I love it. I'm kind of, and what your observation, I'm productive. Part of the reason I'm productive isn't because I've got some enormous self-discipline. It's actually that I'm kind of addicted to it. It's a bit like I was explaining before, it's a bit like, being a gin junkie or liking coffee or something like that. Your day doesn't feel quite right unless you have some or you do some or whatever. I'm a bit like that with writing. I really like it. And if I'm not writing, I get a bit edgy and, you know, I want to see where it will take me today. Yeah. We'll keep it up, Chris. We can't wait to see what turns out of the next book. I would finish there because that's a perfect question to finish on, but I feel like I need to give a shout out to Adam Carroll, who has asked, just out of curiosity, was the setting for Silver partly based on the seaside town of Yamba? Uh, partly. Um, in fact, I did spend some time in Yamba when I was researching it, but 
there's bits from all over. So I live in Canberra, so I spend a lot of time on the south coast of New South Wales. So it would have been easier for me to set the book there because I know the landscape, I know the plants and things like that much better and what the sea is like and everything. But it kind of was incredible that a town on the far south coast of New South Wales was going to become the next Byron Bay, the next boom town. So it kind of had to be up in that part of the world. A lot of, it, a lot of it's from towns down on the south coast and then all sorts of towns up the north coast. So it's Port Silver isn't a fictionalised version of Yamba, for example. And uh, last year when it came out, part of the book tour, I drove from Newcastle up to Coolangatta and I had library events and bookstore events on the way up in places like Port Macquarie and Coffs Harbour and, you know, wherever. And one of the pleasing things for me is wherever I went, everyone said, that story is based on our town, isn't it? So it is, it is a kind of an amalgam. Um, for example, even though it's meant to be set in that real landscape, and there's, so for example, there's sugar cane. So that's very much that part of the world. Escarpment is more like, there's an escarpment in the book and it's more like going down into Wollongong or the Illawarra or the down the Klein Mountain to Batemans Bay or something like that. So it is a kind of a, a mix up, but there are, I guess there's just familiar features from a lot of places. Like, I don't know why every beach in Australia has Norfolk Island Pines, right? But it seems to be the case. Well, thank you for that love letter to the Australian coast. And thank you for bringing me back to Sydney when I haven't seen much of it at all this year in trust. Um, I finished reading it a few days ago. It's a really great read. I encourage you all to pop out and get yourself a copy. There are signed copies available from Booktopia. Um, but for now, I will say thank you, Chris, for being with us this evening and for your conversation. Thank you for your books. I do hope there is another novel coming soon. And I do love that this was my first novel set in a strange post-pandemic world, the world that we're beginning to inhabit now. It was so very real and yet sometimes somewhat dreamlike at the same time. Thanks to everyone for joining us. And we do hope to see you at our next author event. Thank you, Chris, and good night. Thank you, everyone, for, for, for uh, tuning in or whatever the term is, for, if, for, for Zooming. Yeah.